Okay, good morning, students. So now that you've already put your names in the uh, chat box, uh, the one who has just entered the class, it is Mustaf Sheikh, please write your name in the chat box as per the registration, uh, you know, as per your name as registered in the university. Well, now we'll begin with the class. Um, this is, uh, you know, going to be the second last class for you. And we are going to deal with the last two chapters in your syllabus. And uh, as you know, throughout, we have been discussing about the law of the sea and we have discussed over all the classes, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea at length. And the very first convention that is called as uh, UNCLOS 1 of 1958, also called as the Law of Sea Convention, LOSC 1958. Under that, we had four treaties. I remember discussing this with you uh, during the first class as well as the second class. But in this chapter, that is chapter seven, we are going to deal with the allied treaties. And of that, I've chosen to discuss, um, you know, convention, uh, on the high sea. Uh, just I want to talk uh, about it today during this class because uh, that's an important uh, you know chapter and then you can try to connect it with also the uh, United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea in 1982 as well. So well under Law of the Sea Convention 1958 we saw earlier that there are four treaties that is Convention on the High Sea, the Convention on the Territorial Sea and Contiguous Zone, the Convention on Fishing and Conservation of Living Resources of the High Seas and the Convention on the Continental Shelf. But for this class we are going to talk about Convention on the High Seas. So basically this chapter is chapter 7 which talks about allied conventions. And now I'm going to, re uh, I mean, as I said earlier, uh, reiterating it, now we're going to talk about the Convention on the High Seas 1958, uh, which was effective in 1962. That means it was signed in 1958 and it got effective in 1962. In this convention, there are 37 articles in all, and we're just going to discuss a few of the articles here. The Convention on the High Seas 1958, which was, you know, effective, from 1962 was part of the four uh, treaties that are signed at the time of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea or the Law of the Sea Convention, LOSC. Some of the important provisions of the treaty are as follows, that especially Article 1, which talks about the definition of high seas. And they said that high seas means all parts of the sea that are not included in the territorial sea or in the internal waters of a state. Now, Article 2 states that the high seas being open to all nations, no state may validly purpose to subject any part of them to its sovereignty. That means it is an open air, it's the open sea, it's the international waters, and no nation can claim jurisdiction or sovereignty over the high seas. The freedom of high seas is exercised under the conditions laid down by these articles that are adumbrated in this particular convention on the high sea and by the other rules of international law. It's also called the Treaty of the High Sea. So it comprises inter alia both for coastal and non-coastal states a freedom of navigation or FON, freedom of fishing, freedom to lay submarine cables and pipelines, freedom to fly over the high seas. So these four basic freedoms are adumbrated throughout the, uh, you know, this particular treaty. So these freedoms and other factors or others are recognized by the general principles of international law and shall be exercised by all states with reasonable regard to the interests of other states in their exercise of the freedom of high seas. Article 4 of this particular treaty, that is the Convention on the High Sea, that is, you know, a part of the law of sea convention. So that specifies that every state, whether coastal or not, has a right to sail ships under its flag on the high sea. Now that means every state, whether it's coastal or not, they've got the right to sail ships over where? Over the high sea, along with the flag flying high or the vessel that they're using. Or on the vessel that they are using, they need to have the flag of the particular state that they belong to. And every state is open, whether they are coastal or not, to ply or to sail over the high seas. 
Article 5 specifically enumerates that every state shall fix conditions for granting nationality to the vessel or ships and registering ships within its territory, and thus every state shall effectively exercise jurisdiction and control over ships flying its flag with administrative, technical, or social. That means every particular state has jurisdiction over their own vessel, and they have uh, you know, jurisdiction and control over their own ship, ship that is flying its flag, whether it's administrative, technical, or social. They can exercise control, whether it's administrative control, technical control, or social control over their flag ship. Article 6 speaks about ships that sail under the flag of one state, except in cases expressly provided in an international treaty. That means Normally, ships have to have just one flag over the one or any number of flags, but belonging to one state only. They should fly the flag of their own state. However, except it is you know provided for for a particular ship in international treaties, it might, if it has a particular permission to do that, it might. Uh, you know, fly the flag of one or more state. But by and large, as a general rule, under Article 6, as international law requires, ships shall sail along with the flag of its own state or the state to which the ship belongs to. So further, a ship may not change its flag during a voyage, a journey, or while in, in a port of call, except in the case of a real transfer of ownership or change of registry. Now, Article 8 and 9, Article 8 states that warships on the high seas have complete immunity from the jurisdiction of any state other than the flag state. That is, only the flag state can exercise control over the warships. And Article 9 states that non-commercial ships have complete immunity as well from the jurisdiction of other states except the flag state. So the, for, for the purpose of Article 8, the term warship means, what is a warship? So warship means a ship that belongs to a naval force of a state and bears the external marks distinguishing warships of its nationality. That means, you know, they will have a particular mark on the ship that will distinguish uh, that particular ship from other ships. And that normally uh, these warships are under the command of an officer duly commissioned by the government and whose name appears in the Navy list and manned by a crew who are under regular naval discipline. So Article 11 of this particular treaty that is Convention on the High Seas talks about in event of a con col collision, that, that is an event of an accident or any incident of navigation concerning a ship on the high seas involving penal or disciplinary responsibility of the master or, or any other person in the service of the ship, no penal or criminal proceedings for that matter, penal criminal proceeding or disciplinary proceedings may be instituted against such persons except before the judicial or administrative authorities, either of the flag state of the state of which such person is a national. So in disciplinary matters, now the state has issued or the state which has issued a master certificate to that particular person that is a master of the ship. So, or a certificate of competence or license should alone be competent after due legal process to pronounce the withdrawal of such certificates, even if the holder is not a national of the state which issued them. So Article 11 basically talks about the master of the ship or the captain of the ship who may be held responsible for any collision due to probably his negligence. So when there is negligence, due to his negligence, in case there is some accident or collision or some incident of navigation that takes place on the high seas. So they say that no penal or criminal or disciplinary proceedings should be instituted against such person except before the judicial or administrative authorities, either of the flag state or of the state to which he, he is a national of or to which he belongs to. Now, in disciplinary matters, again, distinctly, the state which has issued a master certificate or a certificate of competence or license that has been issued to him alone is competent to cancel that license or to pronounce withdrawal of such certificates or licenses. That is, even if the holder is not a national of the state which issued them. So even if he's not the holder, he's not a national of a particular state, but a particular state 
authority has given him that license. So that particular authority alone has got the right to cancel the license. That means the authority which gives license has got the right to cancel the license. So no arrest or detention of the ship, even as a measure of investigation, shall be ordered by any authority other than those of the flag state. That means no, uh, you know, investigation can be initiated by any authority, uh, you know, of any other state other than those of the flag state or the state to which the ship belongs to and the flag of which uh, nation of a particular nation that it flies. So no arrest or detention on the ship, even as a measure of investigation, shall be ordered by an authority other than those of the flag state. Further, under Article 12 of this particular treaty, transportation of slaves and other unlawful activities forbidden. Article 14 to 22 deals with piracy and it forbid, forbids it. So the Convention on the High Seas, this particular convention that we're talking about, was later superseded by the 1982 UNCLOS 3, that is the third convention, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So there are three conventions, basically. So the first one being United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, 1958, also called as the Law of the Convention, 1958, under which four treaties were signed. So... The treaty that we discussed now is Convention on the High Seas and the other allied treaties are the Convention on the Territorial Sea and Contiguous Zone, Convention on Fishing and Conservation of the Living Resources of the High Seas and Convention on the Continental Shelf. Then there has been a United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea II in 1960, which did not succeed and failed to achieve international concurrence and treaties. So that was the second convention that was there. And finally, the prominent one in force today is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Third, that is the 1982 Convention on the Law of the Sea. So this is all for this chapter. Now let's take a short break of just one minute. Disconnect and join back. We will move to study chapter nine that talks about disputes resolution. So please join back, all of you, nine of you who are there, please join back. And uh, whoever has entered now, please type your name in the chat box.